All right, last time we went over deletes, and um, today we're going to extend into updates. Now, before we talk about the update itself, let's talk a little bit about the kinds of errors that you can get in executing any SQL statement. And I guess these apply for queries as well, all right, but, well, Really, they don't, uh, really, some of them apply to queries, some of them don't. These are more the, the errors that, that you run into when you start manipulating data with SQL statements. And I guess I would break them down into um, four categories. And, uh, you know, this, this is just my own way of looking at it. You know, this isn't anything official. All right. Semantic errors, syntax errors, constraint-related errors, and catastrophes. Ohio is the largest state in the United States. 
All right? That's not true. That's not what we want to say. It's not the largest state in the United States. The meaning is wrong for what we're trying to say. We should say, I guess if you're, if you're talking about area, it would be Alaska. If you're talking about population, I don't know what it is. California, maybe? New York? I don't know. But at any rate, the meaning is wrong. The semantic, or the syntax might be correct, right? That, that statement I made, Ohio is the biggest state in the United States, is syntactically correct. So a grammar check won't pick that up. But it's wrong. It's not what we should be saying at that point. So, pardon me? Like trying to do a query with an update. Yeah, or it would be like, or like this. Here would be an example. You know, delete from faculty where name equals mzellers at lorraine.cc. <coughs> All right. Obviously, syntactically, that's a correct statement. All right. So you won't get an error when you try to run this. But it's probably not doing what you're expecting it to do. All right. Because you're probably expecting it to delete the person whose email is equal to that. Or in actuality, you're testing to see if their name. So that's a semantic error. That's what I mean by a semantic error. And syntax errors, again, would be where we say forgot the where clause, all right? And it violates the rules of the language. These, these first of all, syntax errors you should eliminate 100%. If you have syntax errors, you haven't tested enough, all right? Or at all, <laughs> all right? But you haven't tested enough if you have syntax errors. Now. Some of our queries are very straightforward, right? You know, like if you think of lab, uh, the first database lab that we did, where you displayed all of the automobiles. Well, yeah, if you ran that once, you've tested it, all right? And you got the results that you wanted, or you got an error, all right? Other syntax errors are a little trickier, because there could be a mix and match of, of expressions on a query. Like if you go to LC site and do like a query for courses, you can pick from any mix of criteria, right? You can pick the days of the week the class meets, you can pick the, 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 the subject uh, that it is, you can put in a range of class numbers, you can put in an instructor to take, an instructor to avoid, you can put in any mix of criteria that you want to in. Those kinds of syntax errors, all right, are perhaps a little more excusable, all right, but ultimately yeah, you probably haven't tested it thoroughly or not, or you probably haven't designed your test cases correctly. That's one thing I wish we had time to talk more about in this class, or really in any of our classes, is designing test cases, test scenarios to test certain things, because you want to be as thorough as possible. Can you test every possibility? Well, I don't know. But you can do a lot better than software developers typically do. Let me just put it that way. It's been my experience that, that uh, software developers, unless they apply some sort of systematic approach, uh, don't necessarily test their, their, uh, their code thoroughly. You know, it's, it's um, you know, you go in and, and you run it through a few test cases, and the interesting thing is because you know what it works and what it's expecting, chances are your test cases are stuff that is going to work, and, and then you don't find any problems. All right. But syntax errors should be eliminated or virtually eliminated based on testing. Likewise with semantic errors. You know, If I run that statement and I see that that person is still there, if I run that delete statement that deletes where the name equals the email address, then, yeah, I know something's wrong. So if I didn't catch that, shame on me. I didn't test it thoroughly. All right? So these are largely a matter of testing, testing, testing. And again, testing systematically. What do you think I mean by testing systematically? For example, if you were testing 
And again, I realize this didn't have any database uh, component to it, but it could. All right, we could revise this assignment to include a database component, but I think it still applies. If we were testing the tuition example that you had, how many test cases would you have? How many test cases would you write before you would say that it was thoroughly tested? Three. Minimum. Three? Oh, I'm thinking we got a lot more than three. Well, I mean, there's, you know, local, in-state, out-of-state. All right. Uh, and then you would want to do it for... Low amount of hours. Yeah. Amount. yeah. I'd say nine or one. All right. And probably, yeah. Nine's getting warmer. I see 12, at least. What were you going to say? I was going to say it also depends on what validation you put in there. Yeah. I was going to say, I would see 12 at least of valid data conditions and then any sort of error conditions that you might encounter. So let's assume that you, you've tested the validation thoroughly. And again, and that you would need to develop the, the, the test cases. Test cases for that would probably be haven't entered the hours, haven't entered the day or the, uh, the, the, the residency requirements, haven't entered both of them have entered both of them. All right. So for validation, there's probably four test cases. All right. Now, for testing the logic, once you've assumed that there's good data, I would say there's 12 cases. Because we have 1 through 12 credit hours, 13 through 18 credit hours, and then 19 and above credit hours. Now, People who said nine were thinking good, except for one fact. What if our code, let's say you tested seven, 15, and 20. What if our code was wrong and our cutoff wasn't 12 hours in our code, our cutoff was 10 hours? All three of these tests would pass, all right? Even though that that's not correct, all right? So what I would do is I would test for, the way I got the number 12 is I would test for exactly 12 credit hours, 13 credit hours, 18 credit hours, and 19 credit hours. And I might throw in a couple of other cases as well. I might throw in, so this is like an at least 12. But if I was really testing it, I might test 5, I might test 15, and I might test 20. Or, you know, something like that. Now, you know what? Even that isn't 100% guarantee, right? Because theoretically, theoretically, we could have something that says if you're taking four credit hours, your tuition is a million dollars, all right? This is what is known as white box testing, though. What do you suppose I mean by white box testing? It's kind of a misnomer, but what's a black box? A black box you can't see into, right? So what do you suppose a white box is? So that's what I mean, white, white, a white box you also couldn't see into, right? Uh, probably a clear box is more to it. A clear box is when you have some insight to the way the, the way the code works. For example, if I'm testing this, I know my if statements go from 1 to 12, from 13 through 18, and 19 and above. So I have some insight on how the code works. So I really don't need to worry about four credit hours. Right? Because I know as long as I have that if statement generally right, it is going to be right. Now, again, there's two different philosophies for testing. One is the black box testing where you pretend or you have someone that doesn't know the code test it, in which case they don't know how your code is constructed. They just have a chart of what the tuition should be and your program in front of them. And in that case, it would not be too much to say, you would have 66 test cases, right? One through 22 for all three options. And again, the way I got the 12 is I had four options for three different scenarios, in, out, and out of state. White box testing is where you look and you say, hey, I know a little bit about the way pro the program works, so I can cut down on some of those test cases. I just want to make sure I follow every path of my if statements, all right? And again, to 
truly follow every path of your if statements can be a gigantic task when you start getting into more complicated things. At any rate, <laughs> at any rate, this is what I, this is the kind of testing that you would need to do both for semantic and syntax testing to make sure, hey, there's no secret syntax there that blows up only when an out-of-county student takes more than 19 hours. And semantically is correct. That is, it gives me the value that I expected it to. So that's the answer on this. The answer on this is, we can't plan for them, but we can plan, we, we can expect that at some point they might happen. So we don't know when, but we, we know that some things beyond our control are apt to happen. In which case, really, the best thing that we can do is make our program flexible enough to be able to gracefully handle these. Really nothing we can do to prevent the catastrophes from happening, right? There's really nothing we can do. We, there's nothing we can do that could keep someone from unplugging the database server, you know, when, when someone's about to do a query, all right? There's just nothing we can do. We can test. We can put code in. Really, there's nothing we can do. But what we can do is we can handle those errors gracefully. And by handling gracefully, I mean let the user know what happened in terms of whatever they tried to do didn't work, all right? And tell them how to fix it. And to, how to fix it might be try again later. Call e system yeah, call system administrator or whatever. All right, depending on the application. All right. So, this one we can handle. The reason I'm ha we're having this discussion, by the way, to back up a couple spaces, is handling errors um, really is one of those other things that elevates a program from functioning to good. All right. We had talked about this before. You know, a program that functions isn't necessarily a good program. A program that functions is maybe an adequate program, an okay program, a sort of good program. To make a really a good program, we've talked a lot about maintainability, and now we're going to talk about error catching, because those are two things that really then elevate it up, up a level. All right. The last one, the one that we're going to focus much of our time on, is constraint-related errors. And those are the ones that we saw last time. Those are the ones that we, we suffered with the deletes. All right? Because if I said delete from faculty where FID equals something, and that faculty had students assigned to them or courses assigned to them, you're going to get an error. All right? And in that case, you know, I guess you'd call the error, you know, delete restricted because of a foreign key. All right. In other words, cascade delete wasn't enabled, and um, the row that we're trying to delete has children rows and other tables. So we can't delete it, because cascade delete's not enabled, so it's not going to take out the children as well. Um, and um, it can't leave those children just hanging out there, so therefore it restricts delete and we'll get an error if we try to delete it. Let's think in terms, and let's think ahead a little bit, and we haven't talked about the syntax of updates and deletes, but let's talk about some of the other kinds of errors that we would get with updates and, I'm sorry, I said updates and deletes, I meant updates and inserts. What are some of the other kinds of constraint-related errors that we could get when dealing with inserts and updates? Incorrect data type. Ah, very good. One is incorrect data type. We don't necessarily think of that as a constraint, like we think of foreign key constraints, but it is. If we say that this is a numeric field, that means you can only put numbers in it. If you try to put alphabetical characters in that field, you violated a constraint of the database, and your insert or update will blow up. 
another air, another constraint-related air. I'll give you one that you might not think of, especially if you use the auto number keys, is there could be, just like a delete restricted, there could be an update restricted. If, for example, I have, uh, the, instead of having an auto number key, I use, say, for example, the email address of a person as their user ID. And then there are other tables related to that, and I don't cascade updates. It's almost the same situation as a cascade delete. I won't be able to change it because that would leave the children rows out there hanging, so you'd be restricted to update it. This one, again, is less relevant when we use auto number keys because we're not changing our keys anyhow. And in fact, I really can't think of a case where if I was using a non, you know, a regular key, not an auto number key, I would almost always cascade updates. I, I don't know, I don't know, a, I can't think of a case where you would not want to cascade updates. But anyhow, that is a possibility. Other constraint related errors that you could run into. The format of the data, like is it, if you're calling for, and I don't know, maybe that's the, type, yeah. the, the masks that you can put on, you know, like a date mask. Yeah, keep in mind some of those masks are just like an access thing. They don't really affect how it's oh. stored in the database. So yeah, what you're describing is, is a form of the, uh, of the wrong uh, invalid data type, incorrect data type. Other constraint-related errors in the database. Should be able to think of a couple more. Or a state play combination, 
we would also get an error. So yeah, duplication of data that isn't allowed to be duplicate. So that's all done it on the database itself, though, right? Well, yeah, but still, we could, you know, oh, you, still get the error. you still get the error, yeah, and we still have to handle it. It's just like the cascading and restricting. That's done on the database level itself, but we still have to be in a position to handle the error. Right. Okay. At least one more. like that, uh, and again, depending on the database, you, you have that. So, so value constraints. Like if you try to put in a 20-digit value. Yeah, value constraints. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, or size constraints. If you try to put in, yeah, a 20-digit VIN or a 200-digit a, a VIN, and it only accepts, what, 26 or whatever. All right. <coughs> And then the last constraint is sort of closely related to that, and that would be foreign key constraints, referential integrity violations. I can just imagine, you know, it's like being a football, you know, and, and you know, if you try to, if you violate a referential integrity rule in the database, the little database referee in his striped shirt comes out and throws a flag and says, you know, does a signal, we have a referential integrity violation on this table, you know, 15 yards or whatever. What do I mean by that? I mean if you update or insert a row and the foreign key doesn't hook up to something on the other end. So for example, in your automobile database, you have probably an automobile table that is related to a model of car. All right? If you were to put in a model of car that didn't exist, then you would not be able to do the insert or the update. All right? So you would get an error. Now, let's go and talk about these one at a time and see what we can do to fix them. All right? Let's, let, let, let's go in and, and let's, let's cherry pick a couple of these first and get them out of the way, and then we can talk about the other ones. Update restricted, if we're using auto number keys, we've addressed that one. Otherwise, simply enable cascading. Because I really can't think of a case where I would not want to uh, enable cascading. It's not like deletes. With deletes, I can clearly think of cases where you would not want to enable cascade delete. But cascading updates, yeah, I want to cascade updates. I don't know why that would prohibit that. So this one, yeah, it's kind of a, a moot point. Um, duplication of primary key, if we're using auto number keys, that's one way to, to address that issue. If we're using auto number keys, we're not going to have that. Now, that doesn't address other unique indexes, like VIN number, but it solves part of the problem. <coughs> Delete restricted by a foreign key. What did we do? We tried, and then we reported the error if it failed. And that's a permissible strategy, all right? We may think that, gee, we want to keep all these errors from happening. Well, if we let them happen and then simply inform the user that they happen and so on, that's, that's a good way to handle some of these errors. Let's look at some of these other ones, though. How could we handle required fields missing? Just throw a bug. Red star. And... Right. Validation. 